Praise the Lord. That's all the Alleluia can give. The Lord bless you in Jesus' name. And the Lord bless me too. And the Lord, all the blessings he gives me will flow into your life too. Tomorrow is going to be a wonderful day. A great day. You must be a part of it. Because... A kind of publicity we have never done. Tomorrow, we are going to do it in Lagos. Yeah. You will not be missed out in Jesus' name. Yeah. Say, I'll be there. I'll be there. Say, I'll be, I'll be there. And the Lord will bless all our efforts together in Jesus' name. Yeah. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your people. Thank you for our pastors, our overseers, our leaders, our workers, our members. Thank you for the great thing taking place. Lord, I am praying that your blessings will flow into every life in Jesus' name. And Lord, from tomorrow, even from tonight and tomorrow, and until the retreat time, as we blow the trumpet, as we show everybody the new thing that is going to take place, I pray, Lord, nobody will receive the invitation of your people in Jesus' name. And I pray, Lord, a kind of retreat we have never had, we are going to have at the headquarters here. And in all the regions and all the states and all the countries, everywhere is going to be the beginning of a new dawn in every life, in every family, in every church, and every retreat location in Jesus' name. Tonight, speak to your people. Fire your people up. Help us, Lord, to move on in the power of the Spirit of the Lord. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. We're looking at Romans chapter 1. I'm reading from verses 15 and 16. Romans chapter 1, verse 15. It says, So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. Here you find the expression of the desire of Paul the Apostle. Not only the desire, but the zeal, the passion of Paul the Apostle. And he said, I am ready. The preaching of the gospel is so important, and every believer must be ready. Every believer must be available. And then he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But why? It is the power of God unto salvation. It is the power of God unto transformation. And the power of God to make everyone who believes have all the intention of God, all the plan of God, all the purposes of God for their lives. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 2. Preach the word. That's a command. Preach the word. That's an imperative. Preach the word. That's a non-negotiable. It's not something like, if I am able, maybe I will. If I have chance, maybe I will. It says, preach the word. And it says, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, without long suffering and doctrine. Then it tells us in verse 5, but watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, as we go out uh, preaching the gospel or making contacts with people so they can come and hear the gospel and as we connect with people it might be a little bit inconvenient sometimes you are rising up earlier than you normally rise up and then the amatan period may set in and you are not uh, dragging your feet because of amatan or there may be some physical conditions that may bring some difficulties through those difficulties we're going to preach the gospel in spite of those challenges, we're going to preach the gospel. Whatever happens and whatever does not happen, we're going to bring the power of the gospel to everyone around us in Jesus' name. Endure affliction. Somebody there say, I will endure. Do the work of an evangelist. It's work. 
You see, many people don't realize that evangelism is work. They think it's for leisure. But it's as much work as the work of any other person in society. Think about the work you're doing, the energy it takes to work, the zeal it takes to work, the skill it takes to work, everything it takes to work. Bring everything into evangelism because it's work. Do the work of an evangelist and make full proof of thy ministry. Your ministry will have a proof. We're looking at uh, Philippians chapter 1, and I'm reading from verse 13. It says, So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. You see, Paul the Apostle, he didn't allow any situation to pass without making proper, practical, positive use of that situation. In the city, he preached the word. In the in incarceration, in prison, he preached the word. Anywhere he found himself, he preached the word. And he said, in all the palace, in all the other places too, my bonds in Christ are manifest. And many of the brethren in the Lord works in confidence by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. What's that saying? It's saying because of the way God has sent me to be faithful, then the influence of that, the destruction from that, the passion from that, the zeal from that got into other people. I pray that your own uh, involvement in the work of God will influence other people positively in Jesus' name. And it tells us there, many of the brethren in the Lord, the works confident by my bonds with all that I went through. And now they are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. That whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit. We're united. I said we're united. So that whether you're in this district or in that other group, whether you're in this city or that other city, the same thing we're doing here is the same thing you're doing where you are. We're united in purpose. We're united in passion. We're united in the drive that we're going to get the gospel to everyone around us so that the same success we see on the right, that same success we see on the left, the same success we see in the city, that same success we see in the town, the same success we see in the town, that same success we see in the village, and everywhere that this gospel is getting to, it will penetrate every community in Jesus' name. That we're standing fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Romans chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 13. Romans chapter 10, and we're reading from verse 13. Still talking about the preaching of the gospel so important so essential you cannot uh, allow it to be relegated to the background in romans chapter 10 verse 13 for whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved whosoever we're reaching everyone whosoever the men and the women the boys and the girls the high and the low the ones in the town the ones in the city and the ones in the village everywhere we're going to saturate everywhere with this preaching of the gospel i didn't hear an amen because whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved now look at verse 14 how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed if they do not believe that this is the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior, how will they believe? But look at this. And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard, of whom they have not heard? If they have not heard about Jesus, how will somebody come to a place he has not heard about? How will somebody take something he doesn't know anything about? They must know about him. And they must know about the place where we're going to proclaim him and declare him, where he's going to shower the blessing of the new dawn in every life. He's going to shower upon everybody in Jesus' name. I can imagine as I look at you, I'm looking at somebody there. Who am I looking at? Yeah, the one I'm looking at. I can imagine what you will look like when we go for that retreat. And as you are there, I can imagine I see you after that retreat, you'll be a different person. I said you'll be a different person. 
the thing that bowed you down before, the thing that knocked you down before, the thing that made you to say, I'm always tired. I don't know whether I can go on or not. I'm telling you, the fire of the Holy Ghost will come upon your life. And power from on high will reach your life in Jesus' name. Everything you have missed, think, think about this. Everything you have missed from January to that uh, December, that time is a time of supply. Abundant supply. Sufficient supply. And the Lord is going to, everything in your life that has been there occupying a base on this, is going to evacuate everything. And you are going to be a dynamite in the hand of the Lord in Jesus' name. The same things with the other people. But if they have not heard, how will they come? If they do not know, how will they come? That's why he's giving us the question there. And he's saying, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Look at another question there in verse 14. And how shall they hear without a preacher? If you're a preacher and you're quiet, if you're a preacher and you're silent, if you're a preacher and you're hiding the message, if you're a preacher and you're not opening your mouth, and you're not opening your mouth wide for the people to hear, how shall they hear? And then he says, how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring the glad tidings of good things. Thank God. We're going to do this together. We're talking about the gospel of salvation. And it is the greatest message that man has ever heard. The gospel of uh, the gift of God and the grace of God is the greatest gift the world can ever have. And you know, as you think about your society, anytime you, you wake up, anytime you're going anywhere, somebody at the bus stop is announcing something. Somebody where people are gathering together, there's a bus there, a mini bus there, and somebody is even using a you know, loudspeaker and is saying, Are you you know this one will do you good and this one will they advertise advertisement everywhere as you are going if you don't uh, hear their voice you see the large billboard is advertising something as you even want to answer your phone uh, you know advertisement is coming as you're looking at uh, maybe you use computer you use ipad and as you are checking up some things on the internet advertisement is coming as you listen to the radio somebody is advertising something at the uh, you hear the television somebody is advertising something there's advertisement all over the world and everybody is saying something and presenting something to somebody somewhere but think about it all the things they advertise in any way with any gadget and with any opportunity everything they advertise they are not up to the value of the gospel you have in your hand you have the greatest commodity you have the greatest item and you have the greatest thing that will bless people here on earth and bless people even in heaven that's the reason why we're not going to allow the people of the world who are advertising what they have to go beyond us advertising what we have thank god i have something if you have christ you have if you have salvation you have something and if you have the power of God, you have, if you have the gospel of salvation, you have something. Salesmen, entertainers, sportsmen, and other people, they seize the minds of the people of the world. They capture the people and they keep them, the world's interest, with thoughtful advertisement, with calculated publicity and with well planned sustained seal we must not allow the promoters of temporary benefits to be more zealous than we are we will be zealous we're going to do everything God has called us to do with zeal and with passion in Jesus name I'm talking to you today on unquenchable zeal in gospel proclamation unquenchable zeal in gospel proclamation as we look at acts of the apostles chapter 22 acts of the apostles chapter 22 i'm reading from verse 3 acts chapter 22 we're looking at verse 3 it says i am verily a man which am a jew born in tarsus a city of cilicia yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel and taught according you know, to the perfect manner of the law of the, of the fathers. Look at this. And was zealous, and was zealous toward God as she all are 
this day. Think about what Paul the Apostle is saying. Paul the Apostle said to the Jews because they were zealous about tradition. They were zealous about religion. They were zealous about the Old Testament that had been abolished. They were zealous about things that had no value anymore. They were zealous about things that do not bring salvation. And Paul the Apostle said, I was like this before. I was zealous too before. I was zealous for the things abolished. I was zealous for the things annulled. I was zealous for the things totally cancelled. But now I have the real thing. And if you have the real thing now, you will not allow the zeal of the people that have counterfeit. The people that have uh, something abolished and the people that have uh, something that is of no value, you will not allow their zeal to go beyond your own zeal. And I pray that your own zeal will come up. I said your zeal will come up. Uh, look at the people that enjoy sports. And you see, you see them on the, on the field. When they are playing soccer, when they are playing football. Or maybe they are doing wrestling. Or maybe they are doing boxing. And they are hurting themselves. Look at how zealous they are. And even when they are suffering, you talk about hardship and you talk about suffering. They go through suffering. Look at the people that even just to watch, just to watch, they pay an amount of money and they get there and the difficulties are there. They are pushing each other. They are doing this and that. And yet you see the stadium part how? Because they advertise. Because they publicize. If they are so zealous about things that will not bring heaven, you should be more zealous than those people. I said you'll be more zealous than those people. Look at Romans chapter 10, and I'm reading from verse 2. Romans chapter 10, and we're looking at verse 2. It says, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. They have a zeal, but not according to knowledge. Look at the people that are fanatical. Look at the people that are so passionate, and then they are driving something, and you ask them, what's the end result and the end goal of what you are driving? Well, they just, they just drive. They just do it. It doesn't have lasting value. If these people are so zealous, if these people are so fanatical for darkness, how is it that the people that are in the light and the people that have the gospel of salvation, they will keep quiet. The time of keeping quiet is over. Yeah. We're going to speak out. And tomorrow in this uh, Lagos, after the service, you will see we're coming out in large numbers. All the people that come to church tomorrow, we're coming out. And then everybody, we're going to go to all the various communities. We're going to make noise. I said we're going to make noise. You ask me what kind of noise we're going to make. You see, as we, we look at this area, for example, and then we all come out, and then we wear the uh, publicity garment. And when we come out, we're in this area. And then the people, they don't understand. Some people are sleeping in there. Some people are there, and over there, we bring out the trumpet. Then while you are there, somebody will, you know, stretch that thing and pull it out and blow it. And when you blow it, all the people in their various rooms somewhere, they say, what's happening there, what's happening there? As they come, you are contacting them. You register them. You put all the names and all the telephone numbers and everything. After you have captured everything, then we're going to send all the information to the appropriate quarters. Our leaders will be telling us. And by the grace of God, this retreat, we're going to show that we're zealous. We're going to show we're passionate. We're going to show we have something the world needs and we're going to give it to them in Jesus' name. Uh, you see here what the Lord is saying. The Lord is saying Revelation chapter 3, Revelation chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 2. Revelation chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 2. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 2, it says, Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. What's the Lord saying here? There are people that are, you know, cold and lukewarm and, you know, it's like they're just so, so Christians and they're not making enough noise. You're not doing this imperfectly. And the Lord is saying, turn around and repent and be zealous and we're going to be zealous in this work of the Lord in Jesus' name. Look at verse 19, verse 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, 
and repent. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. If in the past, any time we're doing problems like this, you know, always laid back, always, you know, you know, staying back. I am so and so, I am such and such. Tomorrow is going to be different. I said this time is going to be different. And the blessings you are going to have, uncountable, innumerable. Something you have never had in your life. Even things you are not praying about, you have prayed about it in the past and you have forgotten now, it will come upon your life in Jesus' name. I said I'm talking tonight on unquenchable zeal. Unquenchable zeal in gospel proclamation. Three things we're going to look at. Number one is searchable quest for sinners' salvation through the gospel. A searchable quest quest a desire you have a kind of passion you have you are a go-getter and you know that these souls are important and you have a searchable quest for sinner's salvation through the gospel let's tell jesus christ himself did it how passionate he was how zealous he was how excited he was how he went about doing it and if we're christians we should take after the lord jesus christ luke chapter 19 reading from verse 10 for the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost you have to seek them out before they can be saved. You have to touch their lives before they can be transformed. You have to get to them, reach out to them before redemption will come to them. And Jesus said, the Son of Man is come to seek. You know, Jesus Christ being the Savior, being the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, he could have said somewhere and he could have said, I'm the Savior. And salvation is here. If anybody wants salvation, I am here. They will seek. They will look for me. He was the one looking for them. You see many people in the church. They stay in the church and they say, those people, they know our church. They know we preach the Bible. They know it's a Bible-believing church. And they know some people are even born again and saved. If they want, they can come. But Jesus Christ did not stay in one place to tell them to come. He went to them. We're going to them. I said we're going to them. Every house in our community, they will see one of us. I said they will see one of us. They'll see the brothers, they'll see the sisters. We're doing like Christ and we're reaching out to them. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, and he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, tell me what he said unto them. Tell me what he is saying unto you. Occupy till I come. Occupy till I come. We don't know when it will come. We do not know the time of the rapture. Whenever the rapture will take place, when he comes, he will not find you idle. I said he will not find you idle. Because it says, Occupy till I come. Look at chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 4. Luke chapter 15. We're reading from verse 4. As we look at it, verse 4, it says, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? Until he find it. Go after, go after, go after the lost until he find it. You see here, uh, look up here for a moment. There are people that, you know, they have this idea. Hundred sheep should belong to the shepherd, but only one is lost. And you have 99 led. Are you looking up? I said, are you looking up at me here? If you have 99 sheep here, you have 100 sheep here, as you look, they look similar. You cannot tell. You must count before you can discover that 99 is different from 100. And there are people who are careless about counting. They don't even count. They don't even think about the fact. Not only that, Jesus said, if you have 100 sheep and only one is lost, you will leave the 99 secured 
in the fold. And then you will run after just one, just one. But some people will say, well, what's, what's the matter? What's the matter? We have 100. Only one is lost. And we still have 99. They just carry on. But look at the picture that we have today. One is one percent of 100. 99 is 99 percent of 100. As we look at our community, many of our churches do not have up to one percent of the community. Even if you have one percent, it's like the situation here is reversed. You have one and you have 99 that is lost and you are satisfied and you are staying with only the one percent and the 99 percent outside, you don't care about them. Jesus said, when we have won 99 percent and the 99 percent are with us, and they're settled with us, and they're secured with us, even the one percent that remains, we're running after them, we're reaching after them. That's the reason why during this retreat, we're not going to leave all the 99 percent, the majority of the people, because the minority is in the church, the majority is outside. All this majority outside, we're running after them. We're reaching out to them. We're seeking their souls. And they will come in in Jesus' name. Look at what Jesus told us to do in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. He said, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to a few people and preach the gospel to some nearby people. Who are we to preach to? Every creature, every creature, you understand then what we're saying, that for this retreat, we're going to empty a lot of communities and bring them to it. They will hear the gospel. Through you, they will hear the gospel. Through us together, they will hear the gospel. And we're going to be passionate about it in Jesus' name. Look at how they did it in the early church. You see, in the early church, in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 4, they didn't leave the preaching of the gospel to just the apostles, or to just the pastors, or to just the leaders. Everybody, everybody get, got involved. That's why you are getting involved. I said that's why you are getting involved. Your place will not be missing among the people who are reaching out and launching out to bring people into the kingdom in Jesus' name. I've lost my amen there. Yeah. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8 verse 4. Look at this. Acts chapter 8 verse 4. It says, Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere. What were they doing? Preaching the word, preaching the word. That was their number one thing. That was their central thing. That was the non-negotiable in their lives. They were scattered and they went abroad preaching the gospel. That's the Lord telling us, be zealous, be zealous. And I said, the Lord is going to do great mighty things in every life at this time. Only those of us who are zealous and we're going to have 100% of our church zealous at this time. I said 100% zealous at this time. Other people are not going out and then you are staying at home. Other people are not reaching out and then you are staying behind. Everybody, everybody, we're going to get involved. You know what? So-called believers who are cold cannot bring in this revival. So-called believers who are lukewarm, nonchalant, they cannot bring in this dawn of a new beginning. The, the believers who say they believe, but they are indifferent. They are indifferent. They don't care that people are perishing. They don't care that people are suffering. They don't care people are dying or necessary sickness. When God can easily heal them, they leave them like that. Nonchalant, indifferent people cannot bring in the dawn of a new beginning. And the people who are lethargic and half-hearted, the people who are so-so Christian, China, the people who are, you know, they are neither up nor down. They are not backsliding, but they are totally inside. One leg over there and the other leg here. They are easy going. All those people cannot bring in the dawn of a new beginning we are talking about. Those who are apathetic. Apathetic. They have apathy. They just, you know, they just don't care. They are careless and they are carefree about what we are talking about. If everybody were like that, 
Nothing good will happen in the world. If everybody were like that, even the people of the world who are not talking about evangelism, if they, if they do like that in their games, in their sports, if they do like that in entertainment, if they do like that in the industry, if they do like that in education, and there's no passion, there's no desire, and there's no kind of a force, and there's no zeal, if they're just nonchalant and apathetic and lethargic and half-hearted and easy going nothing will happen and the people in the church who are mindless who are thoughtless they are not thinking of the souls of the people that are perishing they just you know they wake up and then they eat and they sleep and they wake up and they eat and they sleep and there's no zeal such people cannot bring in a real revival but thank god i'm part of the people bringing in revival i said i'll be part of the people bringing in revival the Lord will use you. We're talking of explosion. We're not talking of just, you know, ordinary evangelism. We're not talking of, you know, I talk to my neighbors too. I reach my neighbors too. Anytime I have chance, I used to, you know, tell them, are you born again? That, we're not talking about that now. We're talking about explosion. Somebody shout explosion. I was talking about a movement. You see, when the wind is blowing and the wind is moving everything before it, and the wind is sweeping across the across the community, and you say this is a movement. We're talking about gospel explosion movement. Somebody say gospel. Somebody say it well, gospel. And then join explosion. Say explosion. When something strikes another one and there's a great noise and there's an explosion and then everything that is combustible, everything that is inflammable, everything is burnt away. Every chaff in your life will be burnt away. And then it's a movement, the movement of the Holy Ghost, gospel, explosion, movement. You'll forget about, you know, all the past, how you used to do things, but today now, zeal. Somebody shout zeal. Be zealous and proclaim. Be zealous and proclaim. You're going out, you are driving out, and then you are talking to everybody. They will know. Their city will know there is something taking place. There is something happening. A new dawn. I said a new dawn. The only people see it in your life, they see it in your proclamation, they see it in your attitude, and then you'll be zealous and publicized. You'll be zealous and you'll spread the news. You'll spread it to everyone near and far. They will hear. I said they will hear. Uh, look at the passion, look at the zeal of Paul the Apostle. I'm reading to you from, uh, from um, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I'm reading here from verse 1. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. It says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God is that they might be saved. It says, I don't have any other occupation. I don't have any other thing I'm thinking about. Is that every one of the people of Israel, my kinsmen, is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Look at chapter 9. In chapter 9, that's Romans chapter 9. Verse 1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness with the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ. For my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, it says, even if I could be cut off, if I could give my salvation to them, if I could perish so that they will be saved, he said, that will be all right for me, but I cannot die for them. Christ has died for them. If he wished and desired the salvation of those people to the point, he was willing to die, he was willing to suffer for their having salvation, that is zeal, and I pray that that same zeal, the Lord will grant every one of us in Jesus' name. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 22. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, it says to the weak, became I as weak, that I may gain the weak. I am made all things unto all men, that I by might by all means save some. 
by all means, that means all methods, by all means, that means all strategies, by all means, that means whatever has to be done will be done. And from tonight and tomorrow, whatever need be done will be done in Jesus' name. Everybody will hear. I said everybody will hear. That's number one. Point number one is searchable quest for sinner's salvation through the gospel. I'm coming to point number two. Point number two, inescapable questions for slack saints in the gospel. Inescapable questions for slack saints in the gospel. You see, the Lord Jesus has noticed that there are some people in the body of Christ that are slack. They're careless. They lose. I'm not talking about lose in the sense of, you know, going to do some foolish, sinful things. They, they just don't, their life is not tidy, tidied up. Their life is not really buckled up. It's like they have flappy areas of their lives. And for those lack saints, members of the church, in the gospel, the Lord is asking a number of questions. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 6 and verse 7. The question the Lord is asking. Matthew chapter 20, reading from verse 6. And about the eleventh hour he went out, and he found others standing idle. He found others standing idle. He found them standing idle. A lot is going on, they're idle. Many people are moving up and down, they're idle. Some are blowing the trumpet, some are distributing handbills, but they are idle. And the Lord is asking the question, he says, why stand ye here idle all day? You know what? As we're going out tomorrow, if there is anybody that is going to, you know, stay back at home, you ask yourself, what are you doing at home? When all the others are out publicizing, they are out proclaiming, they are out preaching, they are out touching lives, and they are out reaching lives. But it's, and Jesus asked the question, he said, why stand ye here all the day idle? The question is why? Are these souls not important? Why are you idle? Is salvation not meant for them? Why are you idle? Didn't somebody speak to you before you were saved? Why are you idle? And this time of opportunity, when other people are doing it, why are you idle? Those who are younger than you are, those who are older than you are, they're doing it. Why are you idle? And those who are even leaders in the church, pastors in the church, and those who are overseers, they're doing their going out, and you are a member. Why are you idle? You see a lot of good examples of other people who are reaching out and they're coming on to do it, and you're idle. And Jesus is wondering about you and he's saying, why? Do you stand here all the day idle? Uh, let's go to another question. It says in Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 35. For whatsoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. Look at the question Jesus is casting. He says, for what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or lose the soul of his wife, lose the soul of the husband. You are at home together with your husband. You know that your husband needs, you know, spiritual life and spiritual revival and spiritual power. And because of, you know, something happened between uh, you and your husband and, uh, you know, I didn't like. If you don't like that, what will change the husband? It's the gospel. Forget about what you don't like. The things that will change what you don't like is this gospel that is coming into the heart, into the mind, into the life of your children. Maybe you are child, you know the message already, but daddy, and look at what daddy is doing, how daddy is careless, and daddy is not taking care of mommy very well, and daddy is not, uh, you know, loving to mommy very well, and he's, uh, you know, doing this and this outside, I don't think I respect daddy, forget about that, what's going to change daddy, and what's going to help him to take care of mommy the way you are thinking, this is the time you just brush, uh, you know, all the tears from your eyes, and then you'll be nice to daddy, and you'll be nice to mommy, and you'll say, this 
this thing is very important and daddy i cannot hide this from you this thing is going to make a life better for everyone it's like the, the way the pastor is talking about it it's like anybody that steps into that uh, dlcc even if you don't know how to pray power of god will come upon your life even if you don't know what you need, sir, the Lord will drive you into the ocean of the blessing of God in Jesus' name. And that's why the Lord is asking, you know, what shall he profit you? If you gain the whole world and you lose your soul and you lose the souls of people around you and you lose the souls of your neighbors, it says in verse 36, what shall he profit a man? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also shall the son of man be ashamed when he comes in the in the glory of his father with the holy angels God will not be ashamed of me I say God will not be ashamed of me he will not be ashamed of you in Jesus name Look at the question the Lord is asking in Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. I'm reading to you from verse 4. Luke chapter 15, verse 4. Look at the question. What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? He goes after which man of you will you have a house fellowship and you have ten you are ten in the house fellowship before but now it's like there are seven it's now like there are five all those ones that are lost which man of you which woman of you will not leave those one that are secured and then go after the ones that are not coming anymore you happen to be a zonal leader you happen to be a district person this coordinator and then you look at all the people that were there at the beginning of the year they came for the covenant service and now cannot find them don't you have records about them all the newcomers that have come before don't you have records about them why don't you then go after them that's the question jesus is asking are they not the sheep of the Lord? Are they not lost? Do they not need salvation? And you know some people that were in the church before, they are backsliding. And you still have contact with them, but you are no more talking about the gospel. You are no more talking about salvation. Which of you having a hundred sheep, if one be lost, they are discouraged. And then they are lost in the world, you will run after them this time. I said you run after them this time. And when they come, nobody is going to make them feel ashamed. Nobody is going to ask any embarrassing question. Where did you go? Why did you backslide? Why, why? All that is gone. We're calling them for blessing. We're not calling them to make them ashamed. We're calling them for the goodness of God to flow into their lives. It will happen in Jesus' name. Look at John. The Lord is asking us questions. We're looking at John chapter 21. In John chapter 21, I'm reading from verse 15. John chapter 21, verse 15. So, when they had died, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? That's what the Lord is asking you. You know, there are people every time, you know, after the Sunday service, they cook lunch, after lunch, they go to rest. And then, if they have time at all, if they're able to wake up, they'll come for the evening revival, afternoon revival. But the Lord is saying, do you really love me more than sleep? Do you love me more than your trade? Do you love me more than extra moral studies? Do you love me more than business? Do you love me more than all this is the fish you have caught? Do you love me more? And if you say you love him more, look at what he's saying as a Peter and son and he says unto him, yea Lord, yes Lord, you know, thou knowest that I love thee. He says unto him, how do you show your love to me? Feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. The Lord is asking us then, uh, the master question, the master's question comes to us today. Why stand you here idle all the day with so much to do? Why are you idle? And with so many people to reach, why are you idle? With time running out, why are you idle? What shall it profit you? If you gain the whole world and you lose souls, are you seeking the lost sheep outside the fold or you are only serving the ones inside? Do you really love the Lord? Do you love Jesus more than your business? 
Do you love Jesus more than material gain? Do you love Jesus more than personal interest? Do you love Jesus more than your ease? Do you love Jesus more than wealth? Do you love Jesus more than family and more than, more than friends? Do you love him more than personal honor and personal, uh, personal respect? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We're reading here from verse, uh, I'm reading from verse 15. It says in verse 15, But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be done so to me, for, for it were better for me to die than any man shall make me my glory in vain. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. Can you say that? Woe is me. I can't hear my people. Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. That's why the Lord is asking us then the question. Look at verse 6. Or I am Barnabas only. Have we not power to forbear walking? I am Barnabas only. Have we not power to forbear walking? You know what Paul, the apostle is saying? He's asking the people question. He said, look at me. I've gone here. I've gone here. I've gone there. But I'm still walking. Look at Barnabas. He's gone there. He's gone there. He's gone there. He's, he's still walking. And we can talk of the converts from the Gentile world that were brought into the gospel. And you. Who have you brought to the Lord? You. Who have you led to the Lord? You. Who have you influenced? You. What passion have you demonstrated? And he said, okay, if everybody is like that, you want to rest, have we no chance to rest as well? He says, you want to relax, have we no chance to relax as well? He's asking the question so that he will tell us that this is not the time to sit back. I said, this is not the time to sit back. We're going to do the work of the Lord in Jesus' name. I thought I'll hear a great amen there. Look at Galatians, Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1 is asking the Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, look at verse 10. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? It says, in my doing what I'm doing, my running here and there, what am I trying to do? Am I looking at the faces of people? They like it, therefore I do it. They don't like it, therefore I don't do it. It says, am I trying to persuade men? Do you seek to please yourself why don't you go against your own ease and go against your own convenience and go out and reach out and as you do the Lord will honor your effort in Jesus name it says for if I yet please man I should not be the servant of Christ look at chapter 2 chapter 2 I'm reading from verse 17 is asking us questions chapter 2 verse 17 but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found sinners. Is therefore, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. I said, God forbid. You see, if we if we say, okay, but they already they, they say they have their church and they're still living in sin. And they say they believe in Christ and they're still living in sin. I will not bother them. I have my church, they have their church. The only thing is that they're living in sin. Is Christ the minister of sin? Is Christ encouraging sin? Why don't you go out to them and tell them, although you might be in a church, but don't, uh, don't insult them, don't abuse anybody, and don't uh, make them feel that their church is inferior, but you need to point out the truth to them, that although somebody is in church, Christ still needs to do more, so that the life of that person will come out of sin, and he live a righteous life in Jesus' name. Look at verse 18. Verse 18 uh, we're going to read this one together. That's Galatians chapter 2, verse 18, 1, 2, 3, go. For if I build, if I, if I build again the things which I once destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. If you, you know, because now you're tired, you'll not be tired. Because you're weak, you'll not be weak. Because you are looking at, uh -uh, okay, since the rest are doing it, I think I can steal out time and do something else now. You'll not be like that in Jesus' name. 
if you encourage other people, if you stir up other people, if you wake up other people, if you tell them it is wrong to stay back at home when other people are pushing forward and they're reaching out, if you encourage other people and then after you have sent them forth, you yourself, you are somewhere and you are just careless, just cold, just lukewarm. If I build what I've destroyed and make myself a transgressor, you'll not be like that in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 3, chapter 3 of Galatians. So foolish Galatians, chapter verse 1. Who has bewitched you? That you should not obey the truth. And then he says, before whose eyes Jesus Christ has been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This is only what I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Or oh, what is asking us is this? We started in spirit. Somebody is zealous, that's in the spirit. Somebody who is profitable in the kingdom, that's in the spirit. Somebody who said, I'm not going to look at temptation, trial, or difficulty. I'm reaching out. That's the spirit of God. Somebody who said, I'm going to deny myself, and I'm going to do the work of God. That's the spirit of God. Now, you started in the spirit. If you remember the old days, the good old days, when you became born again, and you were telling everybody everywhere, but now, if you started in the spirit, are you going to finish in the flesh? I said, are you going to finish in the flesh? God forbid you will not finish in the flesh. Chapter, chapter 4, verse 15. Chapter 4, verse 15 is asking us question. It says, where is then the blessedness you speak of? Where is then the blessedness you speak of? It's saying, in time past, you were zealous. Where is that? In time past, you were excited. Where is that now? In time past, you were moving unprofitably and you were telling everybody about the gospel and about Christ. If there's going to be any program like this, you yourself, you will even print tracts and you will print uh, the handbills and be distributing. And then you'll print all these, uh, you know, retreat uh, shirts, uh, t-shirts, and you're giving to this and giving to this. You are multiplying the efforts of the church. It says, that's how you used to do it today. Why have you cooled down? Why are you slowing down? Why are you not like you used to be? He said, where then is the blessedness you speak of? He says, for I bear your record, that if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. He says, if it were possible, if I told you to pluck out your eyes, you would have done it. And they used to say, eh, they idolize their pastor. They are exalting their pastor. If their pastor says, go this way, that's where they go. If their pastor says, go this way, that's they go. But that's a good thing. That's what the apostle is saying. And the apostle Paul is saying, I bear you record. If I told you to cut off your hand because I need that hand, my own is weak, you would have done it. If you were to pluck out your eyes and give me, you would have done it. Where is the blessedness you spoke of? And where is the old time obedience and zeal and drive? Thank God is coming back. I said, thank God is coming back. Look at chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 7. Chapter 5, verse 7. You did run well. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth. Why didn't you go on? Why didn't you increase from day to day? Increase from week to week? Increase from month to month? You did run well. The way we were doing evangelism before, in every bus, at the station, in the taxi, everywhere we went, in the school, in the college, in the marketplace, in the office, everywhere, you did run well. Who has weakened you? Who has stopped you? Who has made you so slow now? And who has made you so weak and discovered you that cannot continue? Thank God we're coming back to it again. Somebody there said you're coming back to it again. Look at chapter 6, Galatians chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. We're sowing good at this time. We're sowing profitably at this time. We're sowing abundantly at this time. And you are going to reap. 
I said you are going to reap. But look at this, but look at this in verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But she that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap everlasting life. Now it says in verse 9, and let us not be weary in well doing. I will not be weary. I will not be tired. I will not be weak. I was saying it for you to repeat after me. You will not be weak in Jesus' name. It says, let us not be weary in well-doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. As we therefore have opportunity. As we therefore have opportunity. Look at this. The retreat we're talking about is not every month. It's not every day. It comes up this December. And this special opportunity and this special chance that you have. It says, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are the household of faith. We're going to do it. I want you to write this down. Write this down. Do all the good you can. Do all the good you can. Because it's telling us now, we have opportunity. And the opportunity we have to publicize, to preach, to proclaim, to pray, to help other people, and to pursue them until they get to the kingdom of God, do it. Number one, do all the good you can. Two, to all the people you can. As she therefore have opportunity, do good unto all men. It says, do good, that's the first line, do good, do all the good you can. Then the next line, to all the people you can. To all the people you can. The men, the women, the young, the old, the friends, the neighbors, the strangers, everyone. To all the people you can. Three, the next line, in all the ways you can. In all the ways you can. Think about this strategy. Think about this avenue. Think about social media. Think about text. Think about email. Think about handbill, think about um, Twitter, think about Instagram, and think about Facebook, and think about everything in all the ways you can. In all the ways you can. Exhaust them, exhaust them. The next line, at all the times you can. At all the times you can. You see, look at the time in which we have. In the morning, afternoon, and evening, at all the times you can. And look at the time when you are close to somebody, when you see him face to face, at all the times you can. Look at the time when somebody is sick and when somebody is weak and is open, is open. Now you will listen to him because of his condition. At all the times you can. Look at the time when you are excited yourself and you are so happy and you say, I can take on any mountain now. My faith is high now. At such a time, at all the times you can the next line in all the places you can in all the places you can is it in the market is it at the train station is it in the bus is it in the school is it in the college is it in your family is it anywhere it says in all the places you can in all the places you can by all the means you can by all the means you can by all the means you can are you riding bicycle to get there do that. Are you taking a boat to get there? Do that. Are you taking a plane to go there? Do that. Are you going by road? Do that. Are you using telephone? Do that. Whatever it is, are you sending somebody? When Paul could not go, he sent a Titus, he sent a Timothy, and it says, by all the means you can, as long, the next line, as long as ever you can. While you're still breathing, as long as ever you can. While you still have your intelligence, as long as ever you can. While the people are still open, they want to listen to you, as long as ever you can. As you are reaching those things, you go over them, over them. Let me read everything to you now. Do all the good you can. To all the people you can. In all the ways you can. At all the times you can. In all the places you can, by all the means you can, as long as ever you can, we will. Yeah. Say, I will. I will. The Lord strengthen you. Yeah. The Lord give you wisdom. Yeah. The Lord empower you. Yeah. And the Lord make you to do, during this period, beyond, above, 
what you ever did in your life for Christ in Jesus name as your activities multiply for the Lord your rewards will multiply the profit of the kingdom will flow into your life and great will be your blessings in Jesus name a searchable quest for sinner's salvation through the gospel number two inescapable questions for slack saints in the gospel number three inextinguishable quickening to saturate everywhere with the gospel look at it that's what the lord wants us to do everywhere everywhere he doesn't want us to say well i've reached this locality i think i can stop now there's still a soul there there's still a person there that needs to hear everywhere 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 we're looking at mark chapter 16 verse 15 mark chapter 15 chapter 16 verse 15 and he said unto them Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Look at verse 20. Verse 20. And they went forth like you are going forth. I said like you will go forth. And they went forth and preached. Tell me what follows. Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. The Lord walking with them and confirming the word or signs following. We're looking at Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, we're reading from verse 60. Jesus says unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. There are things that other people can do, mundane things, material things, physical things, earthly things. Let them go ahead and do that, but you go forth and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus saith unto him, No man, having put his son to the plough, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. You will not look back. I will not look back. Temptation might come, you will not look back. Tiredness might try to steal in, you'll not look back. Discouragement can come sometimes, can come sometimes, but you will not look back. And it may appear that people even push you back and they say, you're doing too much, that's enough, that's enough, but you will not listen to them. You will not look back in Jesus' name. Uh, look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 25. And they, when they are testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Many villages of the Samaritans. And now as uh, we're preparing for this retreat, all the villages around, all the locations around, we're not going to neglect. Romans chapter 10, Romans chapter 10. In Romans chapter 10, look at verse 18. Romans chapter 10, verse 18. It says, but I say, I did not heard, yes, verily, their sound went into all the earth. The jingles will go everywhere. Their sound went into all the earth. And it says, their words unto all the ends of the world. And that's how we're going to do it until everybody were here. Jesus died for everyone. And God is not willing that anyone should perish. And we're not going to neglect or abandon anyone. Everybody must hear. I said everybody will hear. Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 9. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but his long suffering towards word, not willing. You see that not willing that any should perish, but that how many? All should come to repentance that's why the word everywhere is so important we're reaching everywhere we're touching everyone in every place let me go over that again so you will see what the lord is asking us to do inextinguishable quickly to saturate everywhere 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 with the gospel we're coming back to mark chapter 16 
Mark chapter 16, verse 20. It says, And they went forth, did you see that too? And they went forth, they tied themselves down in one location, and they went forth and preached, tell me, everywhere, the Lord walking with them and confirming the word with signs following. And somebody shout, Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 9, verse 6. In Luke chapter 9, verse 6, everywhere, everywhere. Luke chapter 9, verse 6. And it departed and went through the towns and preaching the gospel and healing, tell me, everywhere, everywhere. Somebody shout, everywhere. everywhere. We will do that same thing in Jesus' name. The early church didn't leave anyone out. The early church didn't leave any place out. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8 verse 4. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8 verse 4. Therefore, they that was scattered abroad went, where did they go? Everywhere preaching the word. Everywhere preaching the word. Everywhere preaching the word. Acts of the Apostles chapter 17. Acts of the Apostles chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 30. Acts chapter 17 verse 30. And the times of this ignorance God winked at. But now commandeth all men. All men. All men. I'm waiting for the church. All men. Everywhere to repent. You know what the Lord has called us to do at this time? Saturate everywhere. Reach every soul. Feel every community. Penetrate every heart. Influence every family. Confront every neighbor. Touch every life of the gospel. That's the commission the Lord has given us. And that is the great challenge the Lord has given us. Where they resist, persist. When you talk to somebody, and then the first thing is that there's resistance. Where they resist, persist. Where they are confused, convince. If they are confused, I don't know about this, I don't know about that. That's a chance for you. That's an opportunity for you. That where they are confused, convince them. Where they are perplexed, persuade. They are perplexed. They don't know which one is right, which one is good, which one is bad. Somebody said, it's this way. The other one said, it's this way. We are perplexed. Persuade them. Where they insult, instruct. You know, sometimes you can come to somebody and the fellow, instead of listening to you, and instead of looking at the face value, at the words and the, the, the thing that you have, it's insulting you. Don't insult back. Where they insult, instruct. What it tease and taunt. Sometimes there are people that will ask you some things with insinuation. And then they tease you and they taunt you. You travel and triumph by prayer, by importunity, by constancy, by persistence. You will travel and you triumph. And as they decide, you disciple them. They decide, you disciple them. They accept and they receive. You admit them and reassure them. By all means, by all means, what you're doing is you bring them all to the dawn of a new beginning. You will be a fruit. I said you will be a fruit. As I, as I try to penetrate and see to your heart and it's your desire, I'm sure you're saying, Oh Lord, release me to touch somebody. Release me to touch people around me. And I can see fruitful people in front of me. Yeah. Where are the fruitful people there? You'll be fruitful in Jesus' name. Yeah. The Lord has called us. And remember, do all the good you can. Remember, to all the people you can. Remember, in all the ways you can. Remember, at all the times you can. Remember, in all the places you can. Remember, by all the means you can. Remember, as long as ever you can. I am ready. I said I am ready. Who is ready there? 
why don't you just stand up and tell the Lord, Lord, I am ready. I will. I will. I must. Something must be done. This is our time and this is our chance. It's our chance to get the people to know at this time the dawn of a new beginning. Rise up and tell the Lord. Open your mouth and tell the Lord, Lord, I will. Lord, I will. And the grace of God will follow you and the, and the power of God will follow you. And the spirit of the Lord will not leave you alone. You will succeed.